morning everyone good morning nice to see a full room this morning and um, normally the first hearing is a bit sparsely attended um, I welcome the uh, representatives of uh, civil society who made the request for this hearing and the representatives of the United States of America um, led by the ambassador to the OAS. Um, <clears throat> the hearing this morning, this is the 34th hearing, 34th hearing of the 169th period of sessions. Um, it is about um, reports of killings, disappearances, and multiple forms of discrimination against indigenous communities and indigenous women in Alaska, in the United States. The purpose of the hearing um, is to present information to the Commission on the extreme rates of violence and murder against American Indian and Alaskan Native women in the United States, particularly focusing on the urgent situation of American Indian and Alaskan Native women who are missing and or being murdered and the grave impact of extractive industries on the safety of these American Indian and Alaska Native women. Um, the hearing was requested, as I said, by various um, civil society groups who will introduce themselves as they speak. And uh, we, will, uh, uh, we assign 15 minutes to each party um, for their opening and main address and submissions. And um, then we, the panel, will make some comments and questions. And hopefully we will have some good minutes left for you to make a final response. Um, with that, I invite you to commence your submissions. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much to the Commission, and also thank you to the University of Colorado for hosting us this morning. Uh, my name is Chris Foley. I'm a citizen of Cherokee Nation, and I'm a staff attorney at the Indian Law Resource Center. The rights to personal security and freedom from violence are internationally recognized human rights. Both the American and UN declarations on the rights of indigenous peoples explicitly affirm these rights for indigenous women and children, and call on states to take and adopt measure in collaboration with indigenous peoples to guarantee that indigenous women and children live lives free of violence. The rights of American Indian and Alaska Native women in the United States, especially their rights to safety, are inextricably linked to the ability of their tribes and nations to exercise self-determination and self-governance in their lands. Strong indigenous nations with capable governments and effective criminal justice systems are essential to securing safety for indigenous women and ensuring access to justice. Safe women, women who can exercise their fundamental rights to life, security, and freedom from violence and discrimination are essential to the well-being of our families, our communities, and our nations. Safe women can achieve equality, development, and peace. The rate of violence against indigenous women and girls in the United States is devastating. More than four in five, or some 84% of American Indian and Alaska Native women have experienced violence in their lifetimes. 56% of American Indian and Alaska Native women have experienced sexual violence. Alaska Native women are subjected to the highest rate of forcible sexual assault in the United States. These devastatingly high rates of violence are largely due to an unworkable discriminatory legal system that severely limits the ability of indigenous nations to protect indigenous women and girls and fails to provide them with meaningful remedies or access to justice. United States law denies Alaska Native women equal protection and treats them differently than other women, including other indigenous women, by denying Alaska Native villages the same sort of criminal justice, criminal jurisdiction within their lands that nearly all other tribes enjoy. For more than 35 years, United States law has stripped Indian nations of all criminal authority over non-Indians. As a result, Indian nations are unable to prosecute any non-Indians. The United States Congress has explicitly recognized this terrible problem, noting that without the authority to prosecute crimes of violence against women, a cycle of violence is perpetuated that allows and even encourages criminals to act with impunity in tribal communities and denies Native women equality under the law by treating them differently than other women in the United States. The U.S. has taken some steps forward with recent reforms that enhance tribal court sentencing authority and restore limited tribal criminal jurisdiction over certain non-Indians who commit domestic violence. These changes are welcome. Still, significant legal barriers remain. 
Tribes must meet stringent requirements to use the new laws. There's insufficient funding for implementation. And the new jurisdiction is still limited. Tribes cannot prosecute non-Indians who rape, murder, stalk, or traffic women. They can only prosecute domestic violence if the non-Indian defendant has significant ties to the tribal community. Further, the U.S. has included language limiting restored criminal jurisdiction to Indian country, a legal term that has been taken to exclude nearly all the lands held by Alaskan Native villages, as well as lands held by other tribes, including those in Maine. While the federal law in this field, the Violence Against Women Act of 2013, stands as a victory for many Indian nations, it's not enough. The, the Violence Against Women Act must be periodically renewed by Congress, and work is now underway to draft a new version of this essential law. We strongly recommend that the new version of this law include adequate funding for implementation, as well as strong provisions recognizing the inherent authority of tribes and Alaskan Native villages over the full range of crimes of violence against women, including stalking, sexual assault by a stranger or acquaintance, and sex trafficking as well as authority over other crimes that co-occur with domestic violence, such as child abuse. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank no, you. you don't have to press. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Lucy Simpson. I'm a citizen of the Navajo Nation, and I'm the executive director of the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. American Indian and Alaskan Native women deserve a life free from violence, yet many indigenous women in the United States disappear, are murdered, or experience domestic violence, sexual assault, and other forms of gender-based violence at alarmingly high rates. We are assaulted and murdered by outsiders, by oil workers, by our neighbors, by our partners, and even through the complicity of our federal government due to its laws and enforcement measures that all too often fail our tribal sisters and children. Gender-based violence against indigenous women is nothing new. It has been used as a tool of genocide in this, con in this country since contact. Rape was a tool of colonizers, and turning a blind eye has been a tool of the federal government ever since. In this way, genocide has continued to modern day through various forms of violence against Native women. Federal officials in the United States have acknowledged that human trafficking is increasing in Native communities and among Native populations. This is especially so for Indigenous women who face heightened risks of trafficking within the United States. Because a large number of Indian reservations are located on the United States' borders with Canada and Mexico, indigenous women and girls can be easily targeted and trafficked over either border. Over 60 miles of the United States' northern border is classified as Indian country and under tribal jurisdiction. There are six tribes directly on the U.S.-Canada border and 24 other tribes within close proximity of the northern border or on the shores of one of the Great Lakes. Another 26 tribes are located along the U.S.-Mexico border. Our Alaska Native sisters are close to Canada, Russia, and to expanding in international shipping routes as well. Additionally, oil and gas development on and near tribal lands raises the already high risk that indigenous women will become victims of murder, violence, and sex trafficking. While federal officials have acknowledged the increase, there is little hard data on sex trafficking within the energy development context. There have been some arrests and federal convictions involving victims from one Indian reservation in the heart of the North Dakota Bakken oil boom, and in that case, most of the defendants are believed to be Bakken oil patch workers. When boomtown patterns draw large numbers of outside workers into close proximity with native communities, the rise of sex trafficking, sexual violence, and murder also rises. Due to the lack of tribal criminal jurisdiction over the vast majority of these types of crimes committed by non-Indians, indigenous women are denied legal protections by their respective tribal governments. It is shocking to know that the homicide rate on some reservations is 10 times the national average and that from 1979 to 1992, homicide was the third leading cause of death of Native women aged 15 to 34. Missing and murdered Native women has been a reality in Native communities for decades, if not hundreds of years, and although it is not a new phenomenon, the increasing national attention is. A growing number of disturbing cases being talked about reflect a pattern of federal unresponsiveness, lack of an effective national protocol for responding to and handling these cases, scant data, and institutionalized disregard for reports of missing Native women. Most of these cases remain unsolved. When the United States fails to respond to these reports of missing persons, either because the Federal Bureau of, in of Indian Affairs police is the local law enforcement or the Federal Bureau of, in of Investigation does not feel the situation requires its involvement, the tribal community has no choice but to conduct their own search for missing women and girls. Parents, grandparents, siblings, children, and friends are forced to search and investigate for their loved ones, taking over the job of the federal agencies who are charged to do so, but without law enforcement technology or the resources. 
It's terrible, but these family members are often the ones that find the remains of their loved ones, their grandmothers, mothers, sisters, and daughters. We often hear that there is insufficient data and st statistics on the number of missing and murdered Native women in, in the United States to justify significant changes in resources, responses, and policies. Why is this? First, the National Crime Information Center has a missing person file, but race and tribal affiliation are often not entered. Further, many tribes don't have access to these criminal national to the to these national criminal databases, so tribal governments and law enforcement agencies cannot enter the information. Finally, the National Missing Person Persons file reflects people that are entered and that the local police are actually searching for. But we often hear that local police refuse to open a formal investigation into reports of missing American Indian and Alaska Native women. Why? Too often it is because racism and stereotypes infect police investigations from the very beginning. We know that police often refuse to respond to reports of missing Native women because they assume substance abuse or mental health issues are behind the disappearance, or perhaps because they think that Native women are just more likely to leave their families and communities. This bias is unacceptable. We must not only enforce existing laws, but we must establish, monitor, and enforce standards for law enforcement to follow when responding to reports of missing and murdered and sex trafficked indigenous women. The federal government has a trust responsibility to tribal nations and to the citizens those nations govern. This includes indigenous women and children. The discriminatory and failed response must stop here. Indigenous women and their family need answers and justice. The United States must also not ignore its human rights obligations to respond to and investigate and address these increasing cases of missing and murdered and sex trafficked indigenous women with due diligence. Thank you. Adet Tammy Truett Jeru Seizra. I'm an enrolled citizen of the Anvik tribe, a Degaton Athabasca tribe from the interior of Alaska. I'm the executive director of the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center. I'm the mother of four children, three of those are daughters and the grandmother of five. I'm the auntie to many. I thank you for allowing us to speak here today and giving me the opportunity to share our challenges in the United States as Alaska Native peoples and to provide suggestions <coughs> for a path forward to increase our village safety for our communities and specifically to eradicate the disproportionate violence against Alaska Native women. I'm the carrier of stories and experiences of Alaska Native women and girls that have faced many horrors just because they're indigenous. Too many of our relatives have suffered abuse and death because of a government system that fails in their legal and moral responsibility to assist indigenous nations in safeguarding the lives of our women and children. There are many reasons why, and I have a short time to express to you the grave concerns that we have in protecting Alaska Native women and children when there is no help available such as safe shelter, law enforcement, medical services, or other types of help dealing with the aftermath of victimization. The following are some of the explanations and solutions. The United States has made progress in addressing violence against women. In 2013, during the Congressional debates to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act, the United Nations human rights officials came together and released a public statement calling on the United States to act promptly to pass key reforms to the Violence Against Women Act that bolster indigenous tribes. That the continued jurisdictional gaps, especially those in Alaska, are an ongoing human rights crisis. Sadly, Alaska was mostly left out of those improvements because of its tribal land status that make tribal jurisdiction challenging. Unlike other areas of the United States that share jurisdiction between the U.S. government and Indian tribes, in the state of Alaska, Indian tribes share jurisdiction with the state government. Because of federal state laws, policies, and allocation of resources, tribal responses have been throttled, leaving the investigation and prosecution of crimes, including violence against women and children, to the state. Alaska, like the federal government, has failed in providing for public safety in Alaska Native villages. Nearly 40% of our villages are without law enforcement, and when available, they can be days away. Local control to local solutions and resources is critical to improving the situation for our Alaska Native brothers and sisters. We call on the United States for a jurisdictional fix to the Alaska Native Indian country issue and regular and consistent tribal justice funding. According to the 2013 Tribal Law and Order Commission report, Alaska Native women are overrepresented in the domestic violence victim population by 250 percent. They comprise only 19 percent of the population of the state of Alaska, but 47 percent of those reported rape reports are Alaska Native victims. And among the other Indian tribes, Alaska Native women suffer the highest rates of domestic and sexual violence in our country. 
There is unique opportunity to recognize these issues and make corrections to the law. In Decaton Athabascan, as with other language groups in Alaska, we have no words or description for violence within our family home. We had traditional forms of justice that kept our community in check, and women were valued as life givers of the family. We had community justice, which we're now trying to return to. Peacemaking is a traditional non-adversarial form of justice practiced by many Native American tribes and is making a resurgence in Alaska. It's designed to heal damaged relationships and restore harmony. Peacemaking not only seeks to resolve the immediate conflict, but to foster healing and to help participants avoid future problems. This is a measure supported by a report commissioned by the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues on the Extent of Violence Against Indigenous Women and Girls in terms of Article 22.2 of the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The study emphasized the importance of states working with Indigenous peoples to adopt measures to eliminate all forms of violence against Indigenous women and girls. The study also concluded that the evidence is clear that there's indigenous community exercises when an indigenous community exercises a degree of ownership over the conception and establishment of measures to address violence those measures are more likely to be effective and successful the report further noted the partnership approach between indigenous communities and states are more likely to succeed in tackling violence when solely state devised programs we need to move forward with these recommendations and partnerships and ensure that Alaska Native tribal nations are no longer exempted from continued progress. The federally funded, the United States has created <coughs> funding programs and in recent years, thanks to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Alaska Native tribes are getting much needed funding for tribal justice infrastructure and resources. While progress is gradual, it's happening in meaningful ways. The federally funded Alaska Native Women's Resource Center through the Office of Violence Against Women, U.S. Department of Justice, and the Family Violence Prevention and Services Office, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, is providing meaningful village engagement sessions with Alaska tribes to help with identifying the resources within each tribe to address violence against women in their own voices, languages, and teachings. We have seven distinct language groups in Alaska. We've created a unique theme to each engagement session to work with the tribes towards restoring balance in their community. Um, the Tribal Law and Order Commission Act specifically recommended a legislative fix for the U.S. Supreme Court Venati decision, which is a policy and law that has created much excuse me, issues. One, excuse me one moment. Do you need to, do you wish to request no. additional time? No, I can complete that. Thank you very much. Um, I now invite the representatives of the illustrious state of the United, United States of America to make their first intervention. Thank you. Good morning. Distinguished commissioners, civil society friends, advocates, secretary general colleagues, my name is Carlos Trujillo and I'm the U.S. Ambassador to the Organization of American States. I would like to begin by acknowledging the important work of the commission to advance human rights in the Western Hemisphere. The United States remains committed to supporting your work and it's, honor, it's, and it's an honor to appear here before you today. I also want to thank you for the opportunity to come here today to discuss one of the most urgent problems facing American, Indian, and Alaskan Native communities in the United States domestic violence, and sexual assault. These crimes affect every community in the United States, but tragically, Native women face higher rates of domestic violence and sexual assault than almost any other group. A 2016 National Institute of Justice study noted in the joint request for a thematic hearing found that more than half of all Native women have experienced <coughs> sexual violence and physical violence by an intimate partner. All too often, these instances of violence against women are part of an escalating cycle which has resulted in alarming homicide rates among American Indian and Alaskan Native women. The United States is committed to addressing this crisis through the efforts of our Department of Justice. Our federal prosecutors are working to bring violent offenders in Indian country to justice and to reduce and prevent future crimes. Indian country is defined by the statute to mean, number one, a land within the limits of any government reservation under the, under the jurisdiction of the United States government. Number two, all dependent Indian communities within the borders of the United States and number three, all Indian allotments. Through federal grant programs for tribal communities, we are working with these communities so that they become safer and can provide victims with a full range of services and support. Through federal research, we are deepening our understanding of violence and victimization in Indian country and searching for solutions. And through federally funded training and technical assistance, we're enhancing the ability of tribes to restore public safety and promote healing in their own communities. 
Effective, widespread, and timely prosecutions are critical to stopping the cycle of domestic violence. Early intervention that interrupts or deters a pattern of escalating violence is key to avoiding future and sometimes deadly violence. The Department of Justice has prosecuted an increasing number of habitual offenders in Indian Country under a federal statute enacted in 2005, which focuses on domestic assaults by offenders with at least two prior convictions for any domestic assault in a federal, state, or tribal court. Case management data shows the numbers of defendants indicted under this provision grew from 12 in fiscal year 2010 to 33 in fiscal year 2016 and to 41 in fiscal year 2017. 42 have been indicted thus far in fiscal year 18 as of August 31st. The Violence Against Women Act of 2013 recognizes the importance of imposing serious sentences in cases of intimate partner violence and involving strangulation or that result in serious bodily injury by amending the federal stat assault statute which is used to prosecute assaultants in Indian country. Since then, prosecutions of these crimes have remained an important priority for United States Attorney's Office. In calendar year 2014, federal prosecutors charged 72 defendants under VAWA 2013's Enhanced Federal Assault Statute. By calendar year 2016 and 2017, that number has nearly doubled to 143 defendants and 139 defendants, respectively. In addition to enhancing federal prosecutions, a key provision of VAWA 2013 recognizes the inherent powers of tribes to exercise special domestic violence criminal jurisdictions over certain defendants, regardless of their Indian or non-Indian status, who commit acts of domestic violence or dating violence or violate certain protection orders in Indian country. The Department of Justice supports the work of these tribes, ex these tribes exploring and implementing SDVCJ through the formation of an Intertribal Technical Assistance Working Group, or SDVCJ, a training and technical assistance award to the National Congress of American Indians and the grant program. To date, 21 tribes have reported to the NCAI that they have implemented SDVCJ. In government-to-government -government consultations with tribes, the United States has heard from tribal leaders about the need for robust prosecution of offenders and investigators involving missing women and human trafficking cases. The Department of Justice has heard these concerns by prioritizing reduction of violent crimes and addressing public safety issues such as trafficking of Native girls and the disappearance and murder of Native women. One of the primary challenges in this area is ensuring that there are enough prosecutors to hold perpetrators accountable. To that end, the Department of Justice's Office of Violence Against Women since 2012 has funded Violence Against Women Tribal Special Assistant U.S. Attorneys, these cross-deputized tribal prosecutors are able to bring violence against women cases in both tribal and federal courts, which ensures that these cases do not fall through the cracks. Building on the success of its original pilot program, OVW has relaunched a tribal SAUSA project this year with improvements based on feedback from tribes and the United States attorneys. OVW is using a fellowship model to help attract qualified attorneys who will make a three-year commitment to prosecute crimes of sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking in both tribal and federal courts. Sex trafficking cases that involve one of these four victims, one of these four crimes also may be prosecuted by the tribal SAUSA under the grant. Special training for tribal SAUSA will be provided through the Department of Justice National Indian Country Training Initiative. OVW also has supported training and technical assistance on identifying trafficking cases and ensuring that victims receive needed services. With the funding from OVJ in 2018, the Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition heard their first ever national conference on sexual trafficking in Indian country. OVW is also funding the tribal coalition to provide basic and advanced training for tribal service providers and justice systems personnel on sex trafficking and its intersection with the problem of missing and murdered American Indian and Alaska Native women and youth. The Department's Office for Victims of Crimes Project Beacon Fund organizes providing urban American Indian and Alaska Native victims of sexual trafficking with culturally appropriate comprehensive victim services. And the Department of Justice National Indian Country Training Initiative, training initiative regularly offers training for federal, tribal, and state criminal justice personnel on the investigation and prosecuting human trafficking in Indian countries. It is challenging to assess the scope of human trafficking involving American Indian and Alaska Native populations, in, bar in part because of the underground nature of the crime and the fear of stigma that deters victims from coming forward. The United States, therefore, 
cannot at this time know whether the trafficking has increased among Native populations. However, the Department of Justice National Institute of Justice remains committed to funding research and evaluation in this area and is seeking perspectives on human trafficking in tribal communities from respondents as part of its national baseline study. This year's study is being conducted in geographically dispersed tribal communities across the United States, including Alaska, using an NIJ developed sampling strategy for which the primary aim is to provide an accurate nationalized victimization rate of violence committed against American Indian and American Native women living in, in Indian country and Alaskan Native villages. The study is critical to qualifying the magnitude of violence and victimization in tribal communities and understanding services needed. The National Baseline Study is part of a broader program of research on violence against Indian women in Indian country and Alaskan Native villages. These studies are expected to deepen our understanding of issues faced by American Indian and Alaskan Native women and help to formulate public policies and prevention strategies to decrease violence, violent crimes committed against Native women. The United States recognizes the importance of seeking advice from tribal experts about research in Indian country. NIJ's program of research is supported by newly rechartered Federal Advisory Committee which will include representatives from tribal governments, national tribe domestic violence, and sexual violence nonprofit organizations, and other national tribal organizations. NIJ also has a number of efforts underway related to the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System, which can be an effective tool in addressing missing and murdered American Indian and Alaskan Native individuals. Founded by NIJ, NAM US is a national centralized repository and resource center for information about missing persons and unidentified descendant decedent records that is free and available to the public. Currently, there are low numbers of Native Americans in NAM's unidentified person and missing persons database, which suggests that the tribes and tribal members may not be aware of NAMS. NIJ is working to increase tribal knowledge of and engagement with the system. These efforts have included NAMS presentation to tribal leaders and advocates attending the Department of Justice, Justice's August 2008 Annual Violence Against Women's Tribal Consultation. OVW has also transferred funds to NIJ's to study the NAMS data to better understand the extent of which domestic and sexual violence are factors in case involving missing and unidentified deceased women with a particular focus on Native victims. The United States is also committed to addressing trafficking of Native women, which may occur across our borders with Canada and Mexico. In 2016, the North American Leaders Summit, the United States, Canada, and Mexico announced a trilateral commitment to address the high levels of violence against Indigenous women and girls that existed across North America, resulting in the formation of the Trilateral Working Group on violence against indigenous women and girls. The working group has held three high-level meetings in the last three years, including one this week in Mexico City. The November 2017 working group meeting, which was held in Ottawa, Canada, and attended by then Associate Attorney General Rachel L. Brandt, included discussions on cross-border human trafficking. In addition, in another important initiative to improve public safety in Indian country, the Department of Justice is expanding its tribal access program for national crime information. In response to the concerns raised by tribal leaders, TAP has started to provide federally recognized tribes the ability to access and exchange data with National Crime Information Database for both civil and criminal purpose. This capacity enhances tribal efforts to enter sex offender <coughs> registrations into the National <coughs> Sex Offender Registry, having orders of protection enforcement off-reservations, off protect children, keep firearms away from persons who disqualify from receiving them, and enter arresting convictions into the National <coughs> Database. As of the end of fiscal year 2018, 45, 47 tribes are participating in TAP, which also provides training to support tribal government's needs. The Department of Justice is currently identifying additional tribes to participate in fiscal year 2019's TAP deployment. At consultations, tribal leaders have continued to express concerns about the lack of enforcement of tribal protection orders by state and local law enforcement. In response, the Department of Justice supports targeted technical assistance through both the National Center on Protection Orders and Full Faith and Credit and the Tribal Law and Policy Institute. These <coughs> efforts include a roundtable of best practices guide uh, trading modules on the issuance and enforcement of Alaska Native Village Protection Orders. Moreover, Department of Justice attorneys work directly with tribal, state, and local officials to address instances when the department receives reports about lack of tribal protection, orders enforcement by state, and local enforcement. Tribal leaders, have tribal leaders have described to the Department of Justice the extraordinary barriers that Alaskan Native villages face in providing services for victims and adequate law enforcement responses to domestic and sexual violence. OVW has taken a number of steps to enhance the capacity of Alaskan tribes to respond to violence in their communities. In December 2017, a team of OVW leadership and staff, technical, technical assistance providers, and subject matter experts conducted a two-day project implementing, implementation workshop in Anchorage, Alaska for all 22 Alaskan grantees on their OVW's tribal government program. 
With funding for OVW, an office opened in Anchorage to train layperson and traditional health care providers in Alaskan Native vill villages to deliver emergency first aid to sexual assault survivors, collect and preserve sexual assault forensic evidence, provide referrals to victim services, and educate their communities about sexual assault. OVW, as well as the United States Department of Health and Human Service, continue to fund the Alaskan Native Women's Resource Center to work with Alaskan Native villages to develop tailored responses to domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, and sex trafficking. OVW has also worked to respond to the impact of extractive industries on violence against women, including Native women. In 2014, OVW launched a special initiative to address its increased in incidence of violence against women in, ba in the Bakken region. Located in western North Dakota and eastern Montana, this area had experienced rapid growth in oil and gas exploration and drilling in between the years of 2008 and 2014, which brought with it spikes in population and crime. Back in region initiative grants, which totaled $3 million, were distributed in connection with these two special solicitations. One focused on tribal SUSA and the other on enhanced response to victims. The Back and Region Initiative also included funding for research on the implementation of Back and Region oil industries <coughs> on the incidence of violence against women, which was administered by NIJ. Finally, the Department of Justice funds programs that are developed by, tribal thems by, by tribes themselves to address their particular public safety needs and to provide service to victims of crimes, including victims of domestic and sexual violence. Just two weeks ago, the Department of Justice announced that it had identified up to $246 million to devote to public safety and victim services in American Indian and Alaskan Native villages. This funding comes from two sources. First, the Coordinated Tribal Assistance Solicitation is a streamlined application that allows tribes to define their specific public safety goals and purpose areas, because we know tribal nations are in a better position than federal governments to determine that what will serve their communities best. Solutions to domestic violence and other crime problems facing tribal communities will not come about overnight. Instead, a long-term commitment is needed. These fiscal year 2018 CTAS awards include more than $113 million in grant to improve public safety, serve victims of a crime, combat violence against women, and support youth programs in American Indian and Alaskan Native communities. The Department of Justice awarded grants to 133 Indian American tribes, Alaskan Native villages, and other tribal designees. Of the 113 million, just over 53 million comes from the Office of Justice Programs, more than 35 million from the OVW, and more than 24 million from the Office of Community Oriented Policy, uh, Policing Services. Of particular note for this thematic hearing, nearly 18 million of these awards are made to Alaska Native Villages and other tribal entities in Alaska. This includes a three year award for $900,000 made by the OVW to support the work of the Monarch Women's Shelter. The second source of funding is the Crime Victims Fund. As of September 30, 2018, the Department of Justice has $133 million in grant awards available to eligible, tri eligible tribes, tribal consortia, and tribal designees under the Tribal Set-Aside Program to support a wide range of services for victims of crimes. The awards are intended to help tribes develop, expand, and improve services to victims of crimes by providing funding, programming, and technical assistance. All told, in fiscal year 2018, the Department of Justice doubled the amount of grant funding devoted to public safety and victim services in American Native communities. The increase in resources, together with aggressive investigation and prosecution of crimes, shows how seriously the United States takes these issues. We are committed to working with tribes to reduce violent crimes and improve public safety in tribal communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And. Um, Mm -hmm. oh, yes. Before I, I invite um, the uh, members of the table here to intervene, I would take note that present here this morning is the Dean, Dean and I. Thank you very much for coming again to our sessions. And also, we note the presence of former Commissioner President of the Commission, Mr. James Cavallaro. Not Mr., I should say Professor. James Thank you for coming and being present at this hearing. I now invite, well, I should invite myself, but I'll stay for the last. <laughs> you <still> feel free. <laughs> I, I now invite, it's Yes, and my, my sister, Commissioner Antonia, um, to intervene. Um, thank you, President. Uh, um, I have a few uh, questions of a few issues I didn't quite understand, and if if you have the time to 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 give an answer afterwards or send the information later. But it's a few things I didn't quite understand. 
I'm going to speak in Spanglish, okay? Because... <laughs> Uh, I'm not connected. No, no, not yet, not yet. But just <laughs> okay. in case, get connected. <laughs> no, there's a few words I don't know in English. So, um, uh, first of all, I understand one of the one of the the issues that civil society presented today um, has to do with this statistics and data. Um, there's no um, data regarding the different um, indigenous tribes um, regarding. Um, homicides, disappearance, that's one of the issues. I just want to make sure because if that is so, first of all, I would like urge the state to start working on those data. I think the data is very important so you can do public policies because it gives you the context of where you have to work and which are the issues. So I understand that's one of the issues you presented. Um, secondly, um, you talked about Violence Against Women Act 2013. And I understand one of the issues is that um, tribal jurisdiction jurisdiction cannot process non-Indians if they are responsible of domestic violence. There's a few exceptions, I think, but one of the demands you're doing today is the possibility to, to enable, okay, and I would like to understand in what sense do you think um, that would fight against impunity, because I understand that's why you want to open the, the, <coughs> the um, competence of the uh, tribal jurisdiction to these kind of of hom to homicide and disappearance is against impunity, I understand. And I would like to see in what way you would see that would put an end to the impunity we see today. And um, then um, I would like to ask the state if there are other measures to coordinate both legal systems, tribal jurisdiction and the state jurisdi jurisdiction, because from what I understand, one of the problems we have it has to do with um, um, safety houses, I heard how you say it, safety shelters, and other legal um, measures to protect women that have are being, being abused, domestic abuse. I don't know whether there is any work between both legal systems so that these kind of issues can be confronted together and not apart. Um, and finally, so far you understand my English, no? Okay, I have a problem with the vocab. No, the thing is that sometimes I don't have the words. Um, and finally, I haven't heard anything about um, the industries. I understand part of the, the, the problem we have is, as a, is that the responsibles of a lot of these abuses are the oil workers. There's a problem there. And I don't know whether the, there's any work with um, the private enterprises, las empresas, industrias, um, because they also have a responsibility on human rights and due diligence. Mm -hmm. and, and I would like to know if there's any work being done there. I mean, um, as you all know, today in human rights, um, private enterprises also have responsibility on human rights. And I would like to know if the state is doing anything to work on these issues and to compromise all the enterprises because they have a responsibility of what their workers do in, the, in, in tribal nations. So I would like to know if there's anything being done there. Okay, thank you. Um, I now invite my brother commissioner, Mr. Joel Hernandez, to inter do his intervention. Thank, thank you, Madam President. And Antonia is very humble. She speaks English beautifully. <laughs> I, I, we, I am the one who is going to speak. I am the one. I am the one to, who is going to speak in Spanglish. But I'll make an effort because if we speak English at this meeting, we are becoming more inter-American. Thank you. So, Thank I, and I, I'm sure my president will be and happy I about that. My Thank you so much. Thank you so much for presentation of both parties. This is a very, very uh, interesting subject matter for us to know. And I have to begin by thanking social civil society for bringing this matter to our attention. That gives give us a, a, a better picture of the many challenges we have in the Americas. Having said that, I have taken due note of the challenges and also the efforts that have been made at the federal and state level to address this issue. I take note and I, and I acknowledge the importance of raising this issue to the level of the North American uh, uh, Leader Summit, and that that has been included, that that had been included in their last statement. And that reflects the importance that in North America, the three, three leaders are paying attention to this matter. Um, I, we have also heard all the efforts that ha are being made in uh, law enforcement, and that is important. Uh, of course, one 
primary obligation of states is to prosecute those uh, acts of violence against uh, women. But beyond that, my question goes more in order to know what the root causes are. Uh, Antonia was mentioning something very important, which is the collection of data in order to better understand this phenomena. But what has uh, uh, struck my attention, what has stricken my, stricken my attention is the high level of act of violence against uh, women, in uh, Native American women in Alaska. It's, it's, a, it's, it's really um, astonishing. And uh, uh, I would like to know whether uh, both at the federal government or at the civil society have you making any stories about the root causes. What, what is the, the reason of this phenomena? Is this because of uh, poverty? Uh, is this because of an act of discrimination? I understand the difficulties to come to, 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 to these, these answers, but I think at some point uh, the agencies have to start working at the, at, at, at the very basic level in order to address this phenomenon. It, law enforcement is important, it's necessary. Um, as um, Antonia mentioned, the necessary coordination between jurisdictions is important. I'm, I'm, really, uh, I'm rather wondering about the, 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 the work that you have been doing to know why the, the causes of this problem are. Thank, thank you. I now invite myself to speak. Um, um, as the Rapporteur of Women's Rights and um, against, I also have a, a, another rapporteurship, which is for Afro-descendant rights, but also against racial discrimination. And I understand that this substratum of this, um, what you're basically con um, complaining about, which results in impunity, um, lack of protection at the state of your peoples, and, and um, the, a failure to ensure due process when crimes are committed against w women um, is due to discrimination and a lack of recognition of the rights of indigenous women and native women. But I also, I, 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 uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I also understand that the violence and the high levels of violence is uh, inflicted both by native men and indigenous men and non-members of these groups. Um, and in neither case, if I understood what you said, can you count on uh, the proper due process reaction from the um, officers of law enforcement. Uh, am I right in that? You, you can just nod. <laughs> yes. Um, um, and, and if that is so, it is the state's duty, firstly, to protect. And then, if the protection fails and there are violations, they must ensure that, that the law enforcement agents act and with due expedition when it's uh, violence against women, sexual violence and, and trafficking and disappearance and so on. That has been decided and established by the Inter-American Court when, happily, when I was a member and part of and did the, did the Locus Classicus case there. It is an accepted act and, and this has to be assured. I heard from the state that there is, I think you've mentioned some organization called NAN or something like that, and um, which, which you said um, was not being used by the um, um, native persons and indigenous persons, and it may be that they do not know about it. But if that is so, that is the state's failure, because it's the state's duty and obligation to inform the citizens what uh, um, me mechanisms exist that they can use either for their safety for or for to proceed to ensure that they receive due uh, and, and engage in due process um, when, when um, this happens. And um, I have one yes. I 
And one thing I, my, my sister um, commissioner talked about data. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask both sides if they can supply this to the commission. That is data in relation to each of the villages um, that you mentioned. I, how many people are there, but disaggregated data, <clears throat> the ages, the sexes, what facilities exist in these villages, uh, schools, health services, uh, um, um, uh, law, legal agents, of whatever stature or uh, um, performance, that, whether police, judges, magistrates, or whatever they, they're called. Um, the very full information, because I really must admit, we really don't have much uh, at pres information at, at present in relation to Alaska and indigenous and native peoples. And, and this will inform us um, to weigh what is lacking and perhaps come to a conclusion about why it's lacking, which we one sus suspects is discrimination, um, based on discrimination. Um, anyway, I want to give you time to respond, so I will stop there. Um, but the, the disaggregated data is very important for us. And please remember that you can send written information to us after this hearing. So um, I, I I think we can manage five minutes each. Um, not much, but something can be said in focus. So thank you, please, um, representatives. Yes. Thank you. Um, in five minutes, I think that I'll begin by uh, listing a couple of the recommendations, or going through a couple of recommendations that we have specifically uh, made, um, and I'll focus on some of the law reform issues that we see, uh, things that we think that the federal government can and should do to reform U.S. law to better protect American Indian and Alaskan Native women. Um, first is simply restoring criminal authority of uh, our Indian nations, Alaskan, Amer American Indian and Alaskan Native nations to prosecute non-Indians committing crimes on their lands. We need territorial jurisdiction over crim for criminal matters. Secondly, uh, reauthorizing and strengthening the Violence Against Women Act. That work is going on now, as all, and also the Tribal Law and Order Act. Um, to make sure that there's sufficient funding for these acts, for the implementation, and to make sure that the Violence Against Women Act cover is sufficiently broad, that it covers the crimes that need to be covered. Um, and thirdly, uh, we need to uh, create a permanent mandate uh, within what's called the Victim of Crimes Act. Uh, this act is the largest source of federal funding for crime victims in the United States. Currently, as it is written, uh, tribes don't have uh, guaranteed access to that fund. Um, there have been some temporary fixes, and those are very good and very welcome, um, but we need to have permanent funding there so that uh, victims in Indian country uh, get, the vi get the victim services that they need when, the, uh, when crimes occur. So those are three very concrete uh, legislative fixes that could happen uh, that would greatly improve uh, the situation in Indian country. Thank you. Um, going on with that, with some other recommendations um, regarding the federal response to missing and murdered indigenous women, um, there needs to be uh, some immediate reforms to um, include the development of standardized law standardized law enforcement and justice protocols to serve as guidelines for law enforcement agencies who are responding to cases of missing and murdered indigenous women. And these um, uh, protocols and um, guidelines need to be done in coordination with uh, tribes um, and um, those people on the ground. It shouldn't come from the top down. Um, and then um, substantially increasing the federal technical and financial support to Indian nations. We heard the um, state representatives talking about much of the grant funding that's available, and, and, and that's important. Um, a lot of the grant funding, though, however, focuses on um, the criminal model. And as we heard um, Tammy speaking from um, <coughs> on Alaska, that there also needs to be other forms of, of um, training and technical assistance provided that addresses um, not just direct services, but um, looking at some of those root causes of the violence, which I think comes back down to colonization um, and um, being able to provide a holistic approach for any, any response to violence um, that addresses trauma-informed um, um, practices as well. Um, 
and uh, creating a forum for dialogue, collaboration, and cooperation among tribal courts, federal courts, and state courts, as well as the agencies within those, um, those jurisdictions on the issue of violence against indigenous women on um, tribal lands, as well as Alaska Native lands, and how the criminal jurisdictional scheme under United States law unjustly discriminates against indigenous women. Those are some recommendations. And I have two, um, and I wanted to really quickly make those statements about, it's more about the jurisdictional piece about Alaska, in basically developing a national initiative in consultation with Indian nations to examine and implement reforms to increase the safety of Native women living in tribal lands that are concurrent tribal state jurisdictional authority under PL 280, um, including but not limited to the provision of federal technical and financial support to Indian tribes. The main one for Alaska is support the recommendation of the Indian Law and Order Commission Chapter 2 on Alaska for a legislative fix for the U.S. Supreme Court's Venati versus the State of Alaska regarding Indian Country as follows. Amending the definitions of Indian Country to include Alaska Native allotments and Native-owned town sites and recognize a tribe's jurisdiction equivalent to the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act village land, supporting land into trust applications by Alaska Native tribes channeling more resources directly to Alaska Native tribal governments for the provision of governmental services and supporting Alaska Native tribes and villages with the exercise of criminal territorial jurisdiction. But really quickly, there's 229 federally recognized tribes in Alaska. 179 of those tribes are off-road, totally isolated communities only accessible by airplane, boat, or snow machine in the wintertime. Those tribes, most of those tribes, there's only 40% of those tribes that have access to any kind of law enforcement. Lack of prosecution, lack of law enforcement, lack of any kind of response is one of these creating part of the problem. But part of the problem also has to do with the fact that this jurisdictional piece in Alaska has created a, um, a, a, a just a total lack of being able to get data and able to really do anything about the issue for in any manner. And this is something that we are trying and working towards trying to fix. So I mean, that's a very minimal qu answer to that particular comment, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I now invite the United States representatives to close. Thank you, Commissioner. And we would well like to thank everyone who participated here at this hearing today. We really appreciate the time we've taken to address this issue. We've sent, uh, we've passed around a demonstrative uh, entitled Tribal Domestic Violence Services Overview of Family Violence Prevention and Service Act Funding. I think in that demonstrative, it'll answer a good amount of the questions that were presented. Um, so if, if you want to refer to that. And regarding the NAM, the NAM issue that you mentioned, Commissioner, um, we are aware of the lack of part participation, probably a lack of awareness. One thing that we've done to address that is at the Department of Justice's August 2018 Annual Violence Against Women Tribal Consultation Meeting is really advocate and bring awareness to the system that does that it exists uh, and trying to encourage additional participation. That was done roughly a, a month ago. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a, this is great. We're within time. Um, it uh, remains with me to thank you all for being here present this morning, and that uh, to assure you, um, civil society, um, that we will um, monitor, continue to monitor the situation. And I again repeat, please send us as much information as you possibly can um, to um, enhance our reports that we have to make um, so that we can be base them on facts and solid information. And we will continue to assist you in any way that we can with the state. If I could just ask the state to please ensure that all policies, plans, protocols, mechanisms which are being considered and set up in relation to these peoples, they must participate in the um, elaboration of those those plans, and and perhaps to have ensured that whoever is in position of authority there has frequent meetings with civil society there as well, who are generally the only spokesperson for for the more vulnerable um, um, members of of the communities, and. I know you you would pass that on, and I thank you for that. So thank, thank you, all of you. Thanks to the interpreters, and thank you 
members of the public who sat through the hearing. The next hearing will start in five minutes. Thank you.